Welcome to Mostly Minutia, the podcast about the trivial details of life that are not so trivial at all. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is episode two, Heidi's Worms. And the trivial detail we're going to focus on is my cousin Heidi's worms. I know this generates some images for you. Before I made this episode, all I knew about worms was two things. A, glow worms, which are super cute stuffed animal worms made by Hasbro. B, worms slither onto the sidewalk after it rains. I've always found this rather gross because it's hard to avoid stepping on them. And also, it's super confusing because why aren't they underground where they belong? All this to say, I really didn't know anything about worms. Well, in this episode, we will learn about worms and more. Let's go. So last Christmas, I was at home in Wisconsin visiting my family. I live in Los Angeles, but I grew up in Milwaukee until I was nine. And then we moved to a small town called Oconomowoc, which some people call Okonomowoc because there's an O between each consonant. It's actually a Potawatomi word for waterfall, which I think makes sense because there are six lakes in Okonomowoc. So I was home and I was visiting with my cousin Heidi. Heidi also lives in Oconomowoc. And we were playing records and dancing. And at one point she says to me, Colleen, do you want to see my worms? And totally unfazed, I say, yes, yes I do, Heidi. I do want to see your worms. So we go into her laundry room, which is in the basement, and on the floor right next to the dryer is a Sterilite plastic tub with a white lid on it that has been systematically drilled with holes. Heidi pops off the lid and the bin is filled with worms. Thousands of them. This wasn't strange to me that Heidi had a bin of worms and was actively producing them in her basement. In fact, it seemed almost normal. Growing up, Heidi was always the kind of kid that set traps for leprechauns and moles. She wore waders and caught turtles and tadpoles. Nevertheless, you might be wondering why I easily jumped at the first proposition to see a worm bin. Well, truth be told, I am a fan of the extreme. And did I want to see a huge Sterilite bin full of worms? Heck yes. But why did Heidi have them? Heidi explained to me. It was shortly after she had graduated with her environmental sciences degree and got her first job with the Wisconsin DNR. It was at the DNR that she encountered her very first worm bin. Here's Heidi. Uh, the desk that I used in our office building, which I was very rarely at, I was outside most of the time, but um, the desk that I used underneath it was a, a worm bin. Um, so there was uh, constant composting going on under my desk. So this was like at your feet? This was in the state office building, and it belonged to our department. It was kind of, um, I think it was acquired through somebody's parents had it or something like that. And then, and then the, that person brought it to work and it just never left. Heidi explained to me that everyone's leftovers from their bag lunches ended up in that worm bin. Banana peels, apple cores, orange peels. And it was her job to manage it. We were having this discussion right in front of her worm bin. So I asked if I could see her worms. As you can see, they like to climb the walls and there's all different sizes. Um, there's tiny little baby ones, and there's big fat ones. Um, nowhere near the size of night crawlers. What kind of worms are in here? These, I believe, and like I said, I inherited it, but I'm pretty sure they're red wigglers. I think that's your most common kind of worm in a worm bin. Red wigglers, known under various common names such as red worm, brandling worm, panfish worm, trout worm, tiger worm, and red Californian earthworm. It's a species of earthworm adapted to decaying organic material. These worms thrive in rotting vegetation and compost. But wait, let's back up. Did Heidi say she inherited 
this worm bin? Well, it's funny. Um, actually, I did not make this worm bin. This worm bin was one that I inherited from someone else who was moving out of town. So I had been wanting to to build one for a long time, and uh, I never just I never got around to it. And a friend of mine told me that his friends were moving out of town, and that they had a worm bin and they couldn't take it with them. And I said, Oh. That would be excellent. <laughs> please, please give it to me. I've always wanted one. And so so this is their homemade worm bin um, that I have had. And I'm not sure how long they had it before me, but I've had it for f- probably three and a half years now. Finding out that Heidi willingly adopted and became a mother to these worms gave me a new respect for my cousin. But the more I looked at her worms, the more I realized I didn't know what I was looking at. So there's a lot in here. I mean, everything in here looks like dirt to me, but that's not dirt, right? What is that known to be? All of this, this is all organic waste um, digested by worms, broken down, and it is, they're called worm castings. So this is very, very rich organic matter. It holds moisture really well. I mean, this stuff is really high in like, so many different nutrients and things that the soil needs that a lot of soil is depleted on these days especially like soil that's farmed a lot and you know chemically treated and things like that and digging down in here and like oh my gosh there are so many worms in here heidi reached into the worm bin and picked up a handful of worm castings and literally in her palm were a hundred worms all interwoven into the worm castings which looks like whipped chocolate mousse. It's got a really smooth texture. There's no grit. I mean, save the eggshells that are in there, but but really, I mean, it's it's super smooth and it's it's just I love this stuff so much. I mean, I could sit here and look at my worms for hours <laughs> and not get bored of it and just like, you know, play with it and are red wigglers known for anything? majorly important in composting. I mean, they seem like pretty efficient, like they'll they'll get the job done versus the night crawlers seem like they might actually be a little bit too big for the job. Heidi didn't know the answer to my question, but honestly, I didn't know what I was asking. I mean, come on, red wigglers versus night crawlers. Mr. Allen? Yes. Okay, now it's working. I decided to call Will Allen and ask him my question. He's the CEO of an organization called Growing Power. They're based in Milwaukee, and it's home of the largest urban farm in the world. They do a number of things, but one of their main priorities is growing soil through a technique called vermicomposting, which is the use of worms to convert organic waste into fertilizer. I was wondering, in your opinion, what do you think is the best kind of worm to help put nutrients in compost? Uh, The most commonly used worms are red worms. So when you get worms and you order worms, you're getting a number of different varieties. And red worms are the ticket to go because there are Canadian and African night crawlers, which are much bigger, Mm -hmm. but I've never used those. So that's what we use. We started with about 30 pounds, you know, 18 years ago, and now we have just one farm, 7,000 pounds. 7,000 pounds of worms. I explained to Will Allen how confused I was about the worms and that I didn't understand what they did. They break down our compost. First we compost, and then we bring worms into the compost once it cools down, and the Mm. worms break that down into worm castings. Worm castings is a fertilizer. So what your cousin is doing is creating a fertilizer, but it's the way that they do it. Some people do it by adding food waste, raw food waste to their worm bins. We don't do that because what happens in a compost pile all the juices that come from the nitrogen gets impregnated into the leaves, the soil. So that's food that's there already for the worms. A lot of people don't know that. It takes at least three weeks for it to break down before the worms can eat it. Hope I, um, hope I haven't confused you. <laughs> no, no. I was confused before, and now I'm getting unconfused. This was totally not true. I was totally confused. I understood the part about feeding the worms and the worms creating worm castings, and how worm castings was a fertilizer. But how was Heidi doing her composting different from Will Allen? What did Will Allen mean when he said, first we compost, then we feed our worms to our compost? I decided to ask Heidi to explain the underlyings of her worm bin. 
Um, this is just a couple of Rubbermaid or Tupperware what Sterilite bins um, from Target that fit right into each other. And then um, a lid that snaps onto the top one. Uh, the bottom bin is for catching any of the liquids that come out. There are holes drilled into the bin that's inside that one. And then there's also holes drilled into the cap or the lid that's on top of that middle bin. Um, what do the holes help to provide? In the bin itself that holds the compost, uh, that provides drainage because you don't want too much liquid in your worm bin. Um, the holes in the top um, provide oxygen intake for the decomposing and all the stuff that's going on inside. So with compost, you're supposed to have kind of an equal amount of greens and browns, they call them. And browns is like dried organic materials. Um, greens are, are wet, you know, things like uh, broccoli stalks or bananas or, you know, oranges or whatnot. The browns are, I mean, for example, it could be dried um, grass clippings or leaves in the fall or even uh, shredded office paper, which is what you see on the top of mine. I take our shredded paper from work and, and I bring it home because that also, you know, in addition to the the holes in the bottom for the drainage, you also need things that will absorb the moisture and kind of keep it there, but not let it pool at the bottom and drown your worms. Okay. And then what else is in here? I see. Are those sprouts or something? Mm, yeah. Anything with seeds that ends up in there um, usually will sprout. I've had things growing in here. I've had wheat berries that have sprouted and I've had avocado pits. Lots of avocado pits that have just started growing in my compost bin. Um, I turn it because anytime I put something new in it, you're supposed to bury it so that it doesn't attract fruit flies and things like that. So um, all except for your brown matter, which actually you, you scatter on the top of it. So with these things that are growing, you know, it kind of all gets mixed back in. So you don't end up with any actual plants in here except for the avocado pits, which I've pulled out and put in pots, but none of them have lasted very long. <laughs> I was starting to understand the world of composting. Heidi has the worms. Heidi provides a plentiful environment for the worms, filled with greens and browns, a mixture of dried and wet organic material. But that still didn't answer my question of how Will Allen was composting different from Heidi. I knew there was a disconnect between my understanding of how decaying happens and the worms' involvement with decaying matter. So I asked Heidi to tell me more about the turning of her compost. So you don't want anything sitting on top um, because you want it to break down. You want the worms to have access to it. Um, they're going to have more access to it if it's buried. It's just to get a good mix. It's to mix it up, um, to kind of bring air and oxygen into the lower levels of the compost as well. And then when you're finally ready to start harvesting some compost, that's important to, to bury your food, uh, to bury the composted items in, you know, one half maybe or one area of your bin because the worms will actually all go to that area where the food is and there will be less of them in the other areas and then those are the spots that you want to harvest the compost from. And how often do you feed the worms? They can go for a long time without eating. I'll just say that. It's not something that you have to like, you know, like a dog, you have to feed them several times a day and whatever. Like I can go a couple weeks without feeding these worms and they are just fine. And, you know, once they digest something, I don't think their bodies take everything out of it that they could. And so there's probably a lot of material that they recycle through and pull more nutrients and, you know, whatever um, out of. And so, you know, you don't want a whole lot of rotting stuff um, in your compost bin. You don't want to give them too many things so that they can't keep up. There have been times when I've done that and there's been an odor to it. And so you kind of just have to feel them out a little bit. Yeah, I was going to also say it smells very, very clean. Like it there's does. not a scent at all. And and also I would say your compost bin is very successful because you, when you put something in here, it sprouts. Mm -hmm. That's got to be like a good sign. Like everything's very happy that. Yeah, right. And it, and this thing gets no light either, you know. So when things are growing and there is no, no light. I mean, this is a room with no windows. The light is off 
all the time. I mean, the only time I'm in here is when I'm feeding the worms or when I'm doing laundry, and that's not very often. It should be more often, but it's not. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, when things grow and there's no sunlight, that's that's a pretty amazing thing, I think. That is amazing. By this time, Heidi and I were both up to our forearms in worm castings. I felt I finally understood Heidi's process of composting. Heidi buries the organic matter. The organic matter begins to decay. The worms head to that location and help break it down, leaving behind worm castings, a nutrient-rich fertilizer. Heidi's bin was a one-stop shop with multiple venues. This whole conversation was bringing to light more questions. I wanted to know how depleted was our soil in nutrients that it necessitated the invocation of composting into our lives. I told Heidi I felt like what was in her bin was akin to gold. And I asked for her thoughts on the soil. I think that's, I mean, partially true, is soil and water are the next major um, resource that's going to be kind of fought over. I, I don't know how depleted our soil is. I mean, I've read a lot of things about, you know, how our new farming methods and things like that are, you know, terrible and, you know, that we're, that just everything is, is, is in bad shape and getting worse. Well, one of the questions that I had is, um, what is our soil currently depleted of? Again, I called Will Allen. I figured he might know the answer to my soil question. Well, basically, most soil, whether it's in uh, the rural areas of the country or urban areas, or even suburban areas because of uh, the use of uh, herbicides to kill weeds and grass, there's no micro microorganisms in the soil and worms. And that's what really tickles those micro root uh, fibers to make plants grow. Without that, you have to use a lot of commercial chemical fertilizers to get things to grow. And of course, uh, a lot of people are using Roundup, which is very detrimental to the soil, to the biodiversity of uh, the environment, the bees, and all, all insects, really. So the importance of what we do, I think, is the fact that we grow all of the soil that we use using mm -hmm. um, carbon and nitrogen that we collect. This past year, we collected about 40 million pounds of food and carbon waste and turned that into thousands of yards of, uh, of compost that we grow in. So that's our answer because it's really it's all about the soil when it comes to the nutritional value of the food and the taste of the food. It's all about the soil. And so the only way for us to get nutritious food is to have uh, a highly fertile soil. I was beginning to feel like talking with Will Allen was just like digging my hands into the worm castings. Everything he was saying was so rich, I could hardly keep up. I was shocked to hear about there not being worms and microorganisms in the soil, but I also had a hunch we were in this sort of state. What had caught my attention was what he said about growing all their own soil using carbon and nitrogen. I wanted to know more about that. Well, first you have to understand what is carbon and what is nitrogen. To make compost, you need good compost. You need one part carbon by volume to one part nitrogen. If you're mm -hmm. too carbonish heavy, which is easier to collect than nitrogen, uh, then you're not going to be able to grow food in that compost. Everything has a carbon to nitrogen ratio. So, mm -hmm. for example, cardboard is 800 to 1. That's 800 carbon to 1 nitrogen. Food waste as high on the uh, nitrogen side. So first you have to figure out what is carbon and what is nitrogen because you're going to have to collect those items to be able to grow soil. Things like cardboard, paper, uh, wood chip, uh, straw, hay, leaves are carbon. On the nitrogen side, it's food waste, it's brewery waste in its wet state, it's coffee grinds, which are 4% nitrogen, one of the highest nitrogen sources you can collect. Manures, you know, cow manure, chicken manure, you know, things like that. So it's got to be one part of each to really grow good soil. And you mentioned before that um, Roundup is very detrimental to the soil, and I was just curious about why. Because, I, I, I mean, I do read about the crops and farmers using Roundup, and I am particularly pretty 
sensitive to genetically modified foods, so I try to eat fresh foods, but why is it detrimental? Well, well designer herbicides, which have Roundup in it, uh, they're designed for GMO crops and so- soybeans, corn, milo, cotton, that sort of thing. Uh, it'll kill the weeds, but it won't kill the crop. Sustainable farming that we do, we're growing without any use of chemicals at all. Mm-hmm. So what happens when you're using chemical fertilizer, you're killing off uh, bacteria in the soil. You know, when you're using Roundup and other designer types, you know, it's just like drugs. Uh, many farmers are addicted to, uh, you know, GMO-type farming and, and drugs, you know. That's how they farm today. Our food should be our medicine, right? Like you are sensitive to GMO foods, but you have no idea of how much GMO foods that you actually are consuming on a daily basis because it's pretty much in everything. The only way to uh, avoid that is to grow, you you know, 100% of your own food Mm -hmm. and get your soil test because that's really what's important to figure Mm -hmm. out what kind of bacteria. And I'm not talking about the general uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium test, but I'm talking about the microbial testing of your soil, which is a more sophisticated type of testing. And what is a microorganism exactly? Well, there's all different types of uh, microbes. There's billions of microbes in the soil. Some are good and some are not so good. Uh, but what you, what you want to have is more beneficial microbes than bad microbes. You want the good good guys to outnumber the bad guys. So that's pretty the simplest way I could put it. Hearing his answer started to make me think of our digestive tract, how there's both good and bad bacteria. And if one gets out of whack, things are not going to go well. Let's just say it's a slippery slope. And thank God for probiotics. But if that's what's happening to our soil, maybe we should all be urban farming. Maybe we should all have worms in our basement. Do you think that there are farmers who regularly use composting on their farms? I wonder if there are farms that, well, I guess manure would be like some sort of form of that. But... um, I'm wondering if there are like giant composting bins. Yes, I have actually witnessed um, firsthand one very big composting operation that was actually in um, down, well, it was in technically the city of Milwaukee. Um, and it was called Growing Power. It still exists and it's, they're crazy, like awesome. They do so much stuff and they're very in, inventive and um you know, they're kind of the leader at the forefront of, of that movement. And they're an urban farm, and um, they grow organic vegetables and greenhouses, and they have goats and, like, bees and, um, you know, honey and stuff like that. And this is all in, in the city in an urban area. Um, and they have, they have a big vermicomposting, which is a long name for worm, worm composting, operation. Vermicomposting. This was the first time I ever heard this word. How is vermicomposting different from composting? I decided to look up the definition of composting, and this is what I found. Composting is when you make a pile of wet and dry organic material and you basically wait for it to break down. This can be a period of weeks. The decomposition process can be helped by shredding the plant matter, adding water, and then properly aerating it by turning the mixture. Worms help to further break down the material, which leads me to vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is using worms to further break down a mixture of decomposing vegetable and food waste. The end product is worm castings, and worm castings contain lower levels of contaminants and higher levels of nutrients than the compost had before. Which leads me to my original question, what did Will Allen mean by saying, first we compost, Then we feed our worms to our compost. I finally got it. What Will Allen was doing that was different from Heidi was making heaps and heaps of compost piles. Essentially, he was a gourmet chef to the worms. And when the main course is served, he unleashes the worms. You know, they get produce and things like that that can't be sold from grocery stores. And um, they have uh, coffee grounds from all the different coffee roasters and coffee shops in in Milwaukee and stuff and they have all this stuff brought to them and they pile it up next to their greenhouse 
so that it's it's covering probably like the lower three feet of the wall of this greenhouse and um and it's all worm composting and so they have people that come and volunteer and these people will turn the compost Mm -hmm. and compost actually with like all the decaying and and the activity that's going on in it generates heat Mm -hmm. and so it has a warming and insulating effect on the greenhouses in your own words, can you just describe what Growing Power does? Yeah. Well, we have a pretty large infrastructure. We're the largest urban farm in the world now. Uh, but it wasn't the intention of being the largest in the world. But basically, we support community food systems and train people from all over the world and have these conferences and do food justice work around growing food and justice. So we want to make sure that everybody has access to not just food, but good food. Uh, we also started doing fish farming, and we train, you know, thousands of people how to uh, raise fish in a biosecure manner. And about 75% of the fish in the next five to ten years will be, we're at 50% now, will be farm-raised. But our systems are natural systems that replicate a clean river or pond. It's called aquaponics. Mm-hmm. So we pioneered this system that a lot of people are using around the country and around the world now. Is it different ecosystems living together that kind of that feed off of each other? Yes, it's a symbiotic relationship between the fish and the plants. The plants take out the nitrites mm-hmm. from the water and use them to grow, and the fish survive because now the nitrites are out of the water. We also grow our plants in soil that sit in, in the system, so it's a not only a water-based system, with the nutrients from the water, but also all the other micronutrients that you need to grow healthy food come from the mm-hmm. soil. The key statement for me, if you want to quote me, is it's all about the soil. Thinking about Mr. Allen's statement made me think about my friend Caleb, who the other day had a tomato in his hand with a bright green sticker on it that said the word organic. You know how you can tell this is organic, he asked? And then answering his own question over muffled laughter, he said, because there's a sticker on it. It's not enough to know it's organic, that no bacteria were harmed in the making of the tomato. We're all on a need-to-know basis, and what we need to know is what has gone into the soil that we're harvesting our food from and going back into us. I asked Heidi, if someone wants to start their own worm bin, what do they need to do? Uh, I actually set a friend of mine up at work. She started her own compost bin. So I gave her some of my worms. Um, She also went to Growing Power and got some worms from there. Um, She got a bin, same as mine. But yeah, she pretty much set it up exactly the same way that I have mine set up. And she just, she dug out some of the dirt from her garden because you'll need a little bit more than what your worms come in. And then add some, some food scraps right away. And then pile some shredded newspaper or office paper on top of it. You know, and then the worms will start to establish themselves, and and it'll be pretty easy. I don't think it's a real tough thing to do. Um, was there anything else that you could that you can think of that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, there was one other thing. Um, you can make a, a compost tea. They call it. What you would need for that would be a five gallon bucket um, filled with water, and then a fish tank aerator, mm-hmm. and a little bit of cheesecloth. And you throw your compost or your worm castings into that cheesecloth, you put it in the water, you aerate it for 24 hours, and then you apply that, or you can further dilute it, um, but you can apply it directly to your plants um, with a watering can. Mm -hmm. I guess you can, quote, burn your plants um, because it's so rich and because there's so many nutrients that it's too much of a good thing, and so you don't want to plant anything directly into your worm castings. Um, You don't want to use it as dirt. You want to use it in addition to dirt because, you know, there's a lot of things in dirt itself that isn't in your worm castings, Um, sand and, you know, different rocks and, you know, um, Mm -hmm. minerals and things like that that aren't in here. So I'm just going to get some sound of the worms. It actually sounds like water falling through cracks. I actually always thought that the worm sound, which was surprised me that they made sounds, but yeah, that's something that everybody has been surprised about. 
I always thought that it reminded me of when you're sitting in a bubble bath um, and the bubbles start to slowly pop. That's what I think it sounds like. This episode was produced and mixed by me, Colleen Lindell. A big earthworm thank you to Mr. Will Allen from Growing Power. You can find all sorts of information on Growing Power, the workshops they offer, and their volunteer opportunities at growingpower.org. Also, thank you to my cousin Heidi for showing me the inner dwellings of her worm bin and her laundry room. The tracks featured on this episode are Crystal Protocol by Wave Shaper, Refractor by Tone Box, Waiting for You by Time Cop 1983, and S-A-M by Airglow. You can find these tracks at newretrowave.com, bandcamp.com, or for a listing, you can go to my website, www.colleenlindell.com. Heidi, thank you so much for talking with me about your worms. <laughs> You're welcome, Colleen. I, I hope that it was, um, you know, informative. <laughs>